first of a mine, first of a family of rockets which will open deep space to science and carry humans to other planets. Space is open to us now. This, the second half of the 20th century, a moment in time when our maturing space techie can begin to support the imagination of the past. Yet what is past before Saturn is important. It is easy to say, looking at the Saturn vehicle, this is a product of our space age. These are the people of our space age. These same men know full well that the journey to space began not a few years back, but a long, long time ago. How long? How far back? In ancient Greece, there was the poet Lucian. He tells of a ship lifted into the air by a great storm and carried to the shining island of the moon. But, said Lucian, these were things which were not and never could have been. And for a thousand years thereafter, the men of science agreed. Everyone knew the Earth was the only world and center of the universe, and the stars, well, dots of light illumination. Until in the Middle Ages, the great astronomers and mathematicians, Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, they said, there are other worlds, and proved it. Kepler went further. He conjured up the first human visitor to the moon, a man pulled by demons across the shadow which falls from Earth to the moon during an eclipse. Later, in 1638, two English bishops published serious works on travel to the moon. Fiction, to be sure, but regarded as a blend of witchcraft and satanic knowledge by their contemporaries. Still, it remained for the 19th century and its remarkable prophet, Jules Verne, to bring together the facts and fantasy of space travel. Space travel, announced Monsieur Verne in 1865, may be accomplished by being shot from a huge cannon, a cannon with a barrel 900 feet long. In his story, veterans of the American Civil War band together for the adventure. They sink the cannon barrel below the Florida terrain and then are off to the moon within the hollow cannon projectile. Of course, in reality, the projectile would have fallen far short of the moon, but the velocity computations were surprisingly accurate. And astonishingly, Monsieur Verne hit upon a very familiar launch area. Today, the sites of our space launch areas are everyday images worldwide. And we all know that the rocket, free to operate in any atmospheric environment, is the ideal transport to space. But in the not-too-distant past, this was not readily apparent. It took men of genius. In Russia, the effects of scarlet fever rendered Konstantin Ziolkovsky totally deaf. Plunged early into a silent world of fantasy, his enormous talent quietly produced solid technical studies in a brand new field, astronautics. There were many visionaries, among them the remarkable Hermann Ganswind. His theoretical knowledge of propulsion was less than sound, but he did set down plans for a workable space vehicle. And moreover, he paved the way for the small group of European rocket pioneers who now appeared. Of these, one name stands out. Hermann Obert came from provincial Romania to Germany after World War I. By 1923, at the age of 29, he perfected a complete series of mathematical theories on space travel. His book, when at last he found a publisher, caused a small sensation. In Europe, a stimulated public eagerly discussed Obert's descriptions of rocket space travel. In America, the rocket remained the perennial pyrotechnic every 4th of July. Yet one man, working a quiet lifetime in self-imposed isolation, created a whole space rocket technology. 
In 1919, the Smithsonian Institution published a report. The author, an obscure New England scientist, Dr. Robert H. Goddard. Today, the Smithsonian houses many of the rocket artifacts of Dr. Goddard's career. They present a vivid profile of a step-by-step -step mastery of the theory of rocket propulsion and its practical application. The first liquid propeller rocket flown successfully by Goddard. The first development of liquid cooling for a rocket nozzle. The development of fuel pumps. The use of vanes in the jet stream, coupled with gyroscopes for direction control. All these fundamental technical breakthroughs were Dr. Goddard's. And his work is embodied in every rocket which has flown since his work was done. And in his time, like the other pioneers, Dr. Goddard had his problems with the public, and particularly the public press. His professorial report somehow electrified the nation's editors, at least for a day. But within 24 hours, common sense prevailed, and Dr. Goddard received the editorial reprimand reserved for crackpots. Despite this, the idea of rocket travel was infectious. The widespread symptoms of the era became apparent even to the editor of the Times. People everywhere had rocket fever. And out came the fringe area rocket specialists to join the game. Any number could play. In Central Park, Prince Mikalikais demonstrates his invention. there were rockets for boat propulsion. And in Europe, rocket race cars, rocket rail cars, rockets for ice boats, rockets for gliders. Through it all, aiming toward the true ultimate use of rocket power, space flight, the pioneers quietly sharpened their skills and tried to explain their accomplishments. Today, accomplishments are explained to a vast space news-hungry public. We accept space. We understand something of the rocket's role and that of the rocket's passenger, man. But again, looking back in the dim recesses of history, who was the first man to try for a space flight? Ah, that's right. Who? One who? According to ancient accounts, this Ming Dynasty astronaut fitted his bamboo spacecraft with all the black powder fire rockets it would hold. And when the rockets were ignited by a platoon of pigtailed technicians, one who was converted gloriously from the living... ...to legend. In the 1920s, one man might have eventually created a real moon vehicle. He was persuaded to build one, quickly, for the movies. Professor Obert's space rocket for the film The Girl in the Moon, while technically accurate, was a hardware fantasy. It could never have gotten off the ground. With typical ingenuity, the pioneers appropriated the movie Moon Rocket and used it to raise research funds. And on both sides of the Atlantic, the store of rocket knowledge grew. In America, the young men of the American Rocket Society built and flew liquid propellant rockets. In Germany, the Society for Space Travel attracted the best young development minds in Europe. Among them, a promising student engineer who neglected his classes to work at the grandly named Berlin Rocket Airport. But with the approach of a second world conflict, the rocket once again went to war. Chosen to head the vast research and development project was the youthful Werner von Braun. An early start, support by the German army and the best rocket technicians the first long-range ballistic rocket weapon came into being. 
and by 1942 at Peñaminda, the V-2 was ready for flight. The V-2 was still far from perfect, but the money and brains expended on its development had elevated rocketry from gadgetry to applied science. At the end of the line, the collapse of the thousand-year Reich, the acquired German rocket capability could still turn out 900 large rockets a month. Some of its skilled practitioners were lost. But at the request of the United States, many V-2 engineers chose to work in this country. At White Sands Proving Grounds, they joined with American engineers to resume rocket development. But once again, in the troubled air of the mid-century, rocket development meant development of rocket weapons. All the rocket scientists held fast, nevertheless, to their first faith, the rocket for the exploration of space. Along with the evolution of the missile family, the plans were itemized for the eventual and inevitable space project. Thus, when the Russian satellite Sputnik 1 opened the space age, Explorer 1 was placed in orbit soon after. The conquest of space had begun. Saturn followed, the necessary space servant of the nation. Designed to further the most ambitious space programs, Saturn was planned, built, tested at the George C. Marshall Space Flight Center and ready for launch in little more than three years. But the huge rocket, the men who made it, and the men who fly Saturn are beholden, indebted to those who dreamed of space before them. The roster is long. At the top of the list, the visionaries of old, dreamers of a long ago age of wisdom. Astronomers of the Middle Ages, the enthusiasts of the 19th century, the dedicated theoreticians of the 20th century, the development team which brought rocket techniques acquired in another land, another time, and for other objectives to bear presently on the universal objectives of space exploration. For some of the pioneers, it is still possible to visit and to marvel at the giant their early efforts helped make possible. Some have become part of the team now working to create the Saturn family. But with Saturn and all men who work toward space, history begins anew each day. The fulfillment of the dreams of centuries is just ahead. The great events of history are now visible. Saturn, the space vehicle, now joins this history. Same history new chapter. <laughs>